When did I get started in radio? When I was 16 years old, WTRU, AM 1600, the living end, as it was known on the dial on the radio, you know, 5,000 watt radio station. I was on on the weekends <clears throat> playing the old rock and roll, you know, the monkeys, the Beatles, and all that, having the time of my life. You know, it was just a huge dream come true because for years, you know, even when I was 11 and 12 years old, I'd actually practice with my 45 record player in my bedroom, you know. So I had, I had that wanting to be on the radio in my mind for many years, even before I got into radio. Uh, but, but Jim, you, uh, you worked for a lot of different stations over the years. Oh, I sure did. I started in 1966 when I was 16 years you old. You were still going to Motor Shores High School. Yes, <laughs> I was a radio star, you know, and I was in high school. It was yeah. great. That was just part-time on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to WMUS even before it was country. Right. It was a hole-in-the-wall radio station. You know, you pay them 35 bucks, you, they'll put anybody on the air, you know, for a half hour. And I was on that station the first day they went country, and it zoomed like a rocket. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It was incredible. And uh, I, I watched the whole thing happen. And, you know, a country music audience is the most genuine audience you can ever find. Oh, They're always loyal. there oh, for you. You do a remote, and they would, they would you know, knock the door down to get in. Oh, there was times when I was on both WTRU and WMUS. I was at MUS the first day they went country and it shot off like a rocket. It was just something. To, playing Dolly Parton and Dumb Blonde. I don't even think you can play that song anymore. <laughs> And Tim Achterhoff, my good friend, was there, and he was a workaholic, still is, and he made uh, WMUS what it was and what it is. It's a great radio station. And I was there doing the morning show uh, until 1986, and then I took a year off, and uh, I got a divorce. I was a rotten husband. I'll be the first to admit that, you know, with all those ladies calling you all the time you know the temptation was too great <laughs> I remember the first time i walked into wkbz i think it was 1972 i'd bounce around from you know wtru to mus and then to kbz and it was it was like going into a time capsule yes oh yeah beautiful studios they were old but they were always nice and clean it was across the street from uh, the golf course. Okay, well, from Oak Ridge, yeah. Yes, and uh, no air conditioning. They had yeah. screen windows, but you didn't need it. They had nice trees over the building, oh, yeah. but it was a time capsule. And I was on the morning show playing, you know, Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra, and... Uh, M.O.R., they called yeah, it. Yeah, middle, middle of the road. road you know. Yeah. Hey, t tell them about starting, how you started the, the uh, diesel engine over at KBC. Oh, yeah, that... We they, all did. They had a World War II out of a submarine diesel engine in the garage hooked to a big generator you know George Kravitsky, Kravitsky the <laughs> engineer that had been there from 1948-49 you know he kept everything going and uh, every once in a while the power would go off so you'd go out in the garage and fire that monster up and, uh, you know, he had to know just exactly how to start it, otherwise it wouldn't start. You know? But old George, he taught me how to start it. And I think it was in 1976, uh, we had a very bad ice storm. Okay. You know, we right. got yep. to the studio and everything was dark. Go in there and fire it up. Perfect. Ran beautifully. And it's been sold. It was sold maybe, what, 10 years ago yeah. Yeah. on eBay. For like fifteen hundred bucks, yeah. Yeah. and they rolled it out on big pipes and put it on a truck, and somebody's got it. Probably still working. Sure, it, it took the, it took yeah. the whole I garage. I recall. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm just saying it, had, it took the whole garage. The whole garage was full. Oh yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, yep. yep. Yeah. What, 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 it was a submarine engine, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Too. That's that's stunning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was huge. You know, diesel engines will last forever. Oh yeah, because uh, yeah. they're full of oil. You know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it worked very well. Uh, and then I went to uh, Oldies 98, 98.3, for, gosh, I don't know, five years. And uh, wasn't really on the air because it was all satellite-fed. 
you know, um, I was out selling radio commercials, and that's where the money really was at. And, you know, that's, that's about the time the pie, the business pie, started to shrink because of satellite radio. You know, every piece became smaller. So the owners of your many radio stations, they didn't really want to, uh, or they couldn't, hire local people to be on the air. The, the expense was just too great for being on the air and insurance. So they cut it way down and put it on the bird, as they called it, the satellite. And it still is that way. And uh, let me see. I think I went back to WKBZ or I was, yeah, I went back to WKBZ when Bishop Wells, oh, yeah. a guy by the name of Bishop Wells. When I left. <coughs> yes. I don't blame you. But he had some good ideas, but a little one-sided ideas. And I was just on the AM. They had the FM playing the urban music, which was great, you know. And uh, the ratings came out, and they thought for sure that uh, their FM was going to beat everybody. And so the ratings came out, and the AM beat the FM. And they accused me of cheating. They were saying, oh, he knows somebody, you know. <laughs> so just a lot of other small uh, radio stories. But to me, WKBZ was the number one station, you know, in my book. Started in 1972, and I walked in the door, and it was like walking into a time capsule. You know, it was a beautiful old building, old huge wooden doors, you know and strictly an AM station. They were given a license at one time to go FM. That was probably in 62, 63, but that's before FM was really popular. And they thought, no, it's never going to do much, so they let the license go. But, uh, so I was doing the morning show, playing a lot of great music, Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra, and stuff like that. Those were, those were golden days. I still remember them. And then Cliff Martin, who's here, not on the camera right, but he's to my left. Uh, he did Studio 85 at night. Very talented man. There on the camera now. Playing, uh, you know, the classics. And the music you can only get now <laughs> on, you know, CDs or on YouTube. Things like You don't hear that kind of music anymore on, on the radio. The audience just isn't there. Oh, you mean 98.9, Real Gold Radio, the Low Power FM. John Allen, good friend of all of ours. He was at MUS for many years, and he moved to Texas, was part of Clear Channel, and he, would, uh, he was the engineer for several radio stations. Several radio stations. John was a good guy, but he was way overworked. <laughs> he made good money, but you know, seven radio stations, when you have a thunder shower, they all want to be back on. So he went through a lot. He was there for, what, five, six years, and he moved back to, New to uh, Whitehall. And he always wanted a low-power FM. So he applied for a license, and he got one, 98.9, Real Gold Radio. It was 100 watts, and uh, they also streamed on the World Wide Web, and that was the first time for me, you know, to have streaming capabilities. So I was on there for about two years playing the good old music, you know, music that I started with in 1966, <laughs> you know. And uh, I was also selling radio time. I'd go out and, and visit everybody in the community and they'd buy commercials. And it was a great time. Very nice, very nice station. Then John had a massive heart attack and I left. And now it's still on the air, but it's all totally computerized. Oh yeah, WKBZ, there was uh, Bill Stevens and John Graska, and at WTRU there was Skip Knight, Ray Hosier for a while, and um, Bill Merchant, Fred, Fred Tascone. Yeah. Fred Tascone was the boss in uh, the 60s, and I think he resigned somewhere in the, in the early 70s, but he's still alive. He's a great guy. But he's a, he's a classy guy. He made a lot of money in the stock market. Well, a big blooper of mine happened when I was at WTRU when we did uh, half-hour news headlines. We had to read them, you know.
and I was 16 years old, and I think uh, President, uh, we had President Johnson, right, as our president at that time. And I was reading a headline like, uh, President Johnson has circumcised Barry Goldwater. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never forget that to this day. What, why that popped into my mind, I have no idea. But I remember doing that. News headlines, President Johnson circumcised Barry Goldwater. <laughs> the biggest blooper that I can remember that involved you was when Bill Heitzelman and I were on in the morning. Oh, yeah. And we announced that you had been in a, a major fire. Yes. Do you remember what? Remember I remember that? that. There was a news headline, what, Jim Cox was in a major fire. He survived, but he's badly burned. Yeah. And I heard that on WKBZ that morning. Yeah. I thought, what the heck? So I called up Bill Heitzman, and you were on the air, and you put me on the air, you know? And saying, well, the story was totally untrue. Just some guy that, that uh, knew me over the years, so he said he was me, yeah. you know? But I, he got burned up, and all, I don't know. I when you called me too, you said, "Hey, buddy, I'm." <laughs> <laughs> no, boy, you sound pretty good being in the hospital, all burned up. Because my mom's a little upset with this whole thing, a story that's going on. And yeah. <laughs> So the good old days of radio, I've, you know, there's so many stories that I've forgotten. What, what is there to do in radio anymore? You know, it's, it's all, it's all corporate owned. That's another reason why I got out of it because with, you know, corporate owned, it was just the bottom line. I think things are a little better now, but not much, <laughs> but it was all corporate owned, <clears throat> you know, bottom line, you were just a number. And uh, there's been a lot of places that have been, or a lot of people that have been uh, let go from uh, uh, iHeartRadio or Clear Channel just because they couldn't really afford them anymore. Right. Andy O'Reilly is one of them. Mm -hmm. And the young lady, Britta, Britta Cleveland. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah she was very talented. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but they let her go because they were she was costing them too much. So that's, you know, corporate radio is, is, is what really screwed it up. And combined with satellite radio, you know, and you can get any song you want to anymore off the internet or whatever by the thousands. So. So no good, you, you, can't, you can't be the guy at 16 years old walking into a radio station saying, can I have a job? Anymore? No. Yeah. Now in sales, if they want to get out and sell commercials, that, you know, there's always a selling job available. But as far as being on the air, you're only talking about very small radio stations anymore in small communities. And, you know, it's a fun thing to do, but you won't, sure won't make much money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice to be on here today.